Welcome to all my YouTube subscribers. My guest on Facing the Canon this week is Barry Woodward, once an addict. Barry Woodward, welcome to Facing the Canon. Great to be with you, John. Always great to be with Always. you. Barry, your book title is Once an Addict. So you were once an addict. Let's start there. Tell us, tell us about those days when you were an addict. Well, it started with me when I left school, John. I left school with no qualifications, got involved with a group of people who were experimenting, smoking cannabis, taking LSD and using amphetamines. And for me as a young person, that seemed really an exciting life to live. And I started to hang around with these guys and I started to take the drink, same drugs they were taking. And before you knew it, we were taking heroin. And uh, I remember it was a Friday night. We're in Jackie Marshall's bedroom. She lived on a council estate in Salford. And nine of us were crammed in this little box room. We're smoking cannabis and listening to Bob Marley and the Whalers. The windows are vibrating with the bass line. We've got money in our pockets. And we're getting ready to go to Manchester as we did every weekend clubbing. And one of the lads came in, he says, hey guys, I've got some heroin who wants some. And we all went quiet. And I remember the glimmer of curiosity in Craig's brown eyes. He was always the first to jump in. He said, I'm up for it. You, he said, I'm game. And everybody in the room had their heroin. And I was the last one out of all of us. They're going, come on, Woody, it's your turn. And I remember thinking, I don't want to be the odd one out. I don't want to be the only one not to take the heroin because I want to know what it feels like. And I must say that was, I said yes, of course. So you succumbed to peer pressure. I did, absolutely. I'm not blaming my friends. No, no. Because I'm responsible for my own choices. Of but course. the pressure of my friends, because they'd all done it and the excitement of it all and, oh, well, I don't, I don't really want to be the only one not to. And that was the worst choice I ever made in my life because then it was all downhill from there. Yeah. I became an addict, but I was once an addict. Absolutely. So tell us about the days that followed and um, how bad did it get? And Well, I met a woman who was 11 years older than me and she was going out with a drug dealer who was well known in Moss Side. And I started to go out with this girl behind this drug dealer's back for, for quite a few months really. And then it, everything changed and the drug, drug dealer found out. And we moved into a block of flats that are still there today in Moss Side called Meredith Court. And now I'm living in my side. I'm with this woman who's 11 years old, older than me. She's got a lot of contacts. And, and by this point, I'd started to, to sell cannabis, very small time, and, and, and sell a little bit of amphetamines at weekends and LSD. But when I moved into that flat, now I had a flat, a base, where people could come to buy drugs from. So they could come to my house or my flat any time of day, any time of night. So I started to make decent money. And it was when I was living in Meredith Court when I started to sell heroin. So it all started that Friday night in Jackie Marshall's bedroom. Yes. And now I'm in my side in a flat selling heroin. And obviously my, my habit grew and I, I started to commit different crimes to pay uh, for the money that I needed to, to, to source the drugs that I was addicted to. And that was my life for years. I ended up in prison, John. I, I, I went in prison. Yes. I was under 21 the first time and I got put on the hospital wing because I was a heroin addict. In those days, they gave you no treatment. They just put you on the hospital wing for a time. And then I, I came out of the hospital wing and they put me on uh, the young offenders wing. I was on there for quite a few months. And then I, I eventually got out and I just went straight back to my side, back to the drugs, back to the crime, back to the madness. Straight away? Straight away, straight away. Oh, in fact, the first day I got out of prison on that occasion, I had heroin. And, and that, was, that was the story of my life for, for quite a long time. So even though you were like in prison for a while, you still made the decision to take heroin the day you got out. Yeah, I, I, I got drugs smuggled into prison while I was in prison. But then obviously you encountered the truth. I did. Jesus Christ mm. and Jesus Christ set you free. He did. Tell us a little bit, how did that happen? Well, I came out from one sentence, John. Uh, I, I'd, and I, another sent, I'd, been, I'd done a sentence this time, I'd been impressed in prison. And again, first day that I got out, I went and scored heroin and, and I bought loads of amphetamines, which gives you energy. And I just wanted to celebrate getting out of prison. And 
I wouldn't let myself sleep. I just, instead of sleeping, I just take more amphetamines, more amphetamines, more amphetamines. And nine months later, after getting out of prison, I, I, I was still awake. I hadn't slept. And, and God knows that's true. The mind has, has got a, a tremendous capacity to handle a certain amount of abuse, and the body has. So I'd been awake for nine months. I was skinny as a rake, and then right out of the blue, I started to hear voices. And I thought all the people that I knew who lived in the flats where I lived on the ball rings in Moss Side, in Newman Moss Side, were shouting out the windows at me. And I was convinced that they were real. And I lived with those voices for nine years. Amphetamine psychosis, the diagnosis was. I'd been in a mental hospital for a few months as well. And then I'd split up with my girlfriend, Lisa, and I moved to the outskirts of Greater Manchester into this little flat down a cul-de-sac. I'd lived in yes. hostels. I spent a year in one hostel. I've lived in host literally lived in hostels. They've been my home. But then I moved into this little flat. And Thursdays were the best day of the week for me because I cashed my benefits on a Thursday. So I went into the post office this Thursday, cashed my benefits, got my money, put my money in my pocket, gets on this bus to go into the town centre. The bus takes off, it stops at the next stop, and this guy gets on. He's got a bottle dot tattooed on his face. He's got a big fat neck and short stumpy fingers. And there was only two seats spare, one next to me and one on the other side of the bus. And this guy gets on, I'm thinking, oh, I hope he don't sit next to me. I wasn't in the mood for a conversation. Sure. You know, but he walks past that seat and he sits on the seat next to me. I'm thinking, oh, no. He said, you're all right, mate. How are you doing? I'm thinking I was doing all right till you sat down. Yes. He said, my name's John. So we got chatting and he was really friendly. I remember getting off the bus thinking that guy was all right. He had something that was different. Yeah. So that was the Thursday. The following Sunday, I was taking my dog for a walk. I had a little Jack Russell called Kim. She had a black patch on one eye, short, stumpy tail. And she was really <laughs> aggressive. I'd got her from yeah. the, the dog's home in Manchester. And as I was walking past the hospital to get her to this field that I took her to every day, I bumped into this guy again. I said, mate, remember me? I was talking to you on the bus on Thursday. He said, of course I remember you. I says, where have you been? He said, church. I thought, oh no, he's a Bible basher. Yeah. He says, you can come if you want. We meet every Sunday in the hospital grounds. I said, mate, church ate my thing. He said, okay, he went his way. I went mine the next day and taking my dog for a walk past the hospital. And now I'm looking for a church as I'm walking past, but I couldn't see a church building. He must have been having me on. No church in there. Wednesday was my first appointment with my new psychiatrist in this new area. Since moving from central Manchester to the outskirts, this was my first appointment with, the, with my new psychiatrist. His name was Dr. Samuel Yangi. He was from Nigeria. I thought nothing of that appointment. It was just normal for me to be having appointments with doctors and psychiatrists. That afternoon, taking my dog for a walk, looking for a church. No way could I see a church. Friday morning, 10 past nine. Knock on my front door. Who's that? Is that the police? Natural reaction. Of course. <laughs> yes. Still today, I went to the front door. Opened the door, it was this little woman. She said, hi, I'm your next door but one neighbour. I've come to introduce myself, my name's Dot. She said, you just moved in, haven't you? I said, yeah, a few weeks ago. Your dad raised red cow, doesn't he? I said, yeah. He said, she said, you've not got much furniture, have you? I said, no. She said, I've just got a brand new fridge freezer. If you want my old one, you can have it for free. So I took her fridge freezer, even though I had one and sold it to my brother for 20 quid. Yes. Yeah. And then just before she left my doorstep, I said, Dot, she told me your name. Can you help me out? I said, the other day I met this guy when I was taking my dog for a walk past the hospital grounds and he told me they went to church in the hospital grounds and this week I've been looking for it and I can't see it. Do you know where it is? She says, oh yeah, I go to that church. <laughs> I'll take you on Sunday if you want. I'm thinking, yeah. oh no, I didn't want that. I'll come for you. So Sunday she comes, knocks on the door, walk up Birchall Road into the hospital grounds and she takes me into a, a prefab. It wasn't a church building, it was a house church. And they used to meet on a Sunday in this community type centre place in, in, the, in the hospital grounds. I walks in, sits on the second row from the front, Dot sits to the end, I sits next to her. Then there was a tap on my shoulder. I look round, it was the guy that I met on the bus with the bar to Dot, the big fat neck and the short stumpy fingers. He said, mate, I didn't think you were interested in coming. I said, I wasn't. But Dot knocked on my door. This is Dot. He says, you don't need to introduce me to Dot. He says, well done, Dot, for bringing him. Yes. I'm thinking these two have set me up. They must have planned it. And then I heard the words behind me, hallelujah, praise the Lord. I looked round and it was my Nigerian psychiatrist. <laughs> it was an elder in the church. Amazing.
You couldn't make it up, could you? Uh, n not at all. I'm thinking of these guys been following me. Yeah. Remember, I wasn't well. <laughs> I was suffering from amphetamine psychosis. Yeah. They've been following me, but that was that was it. So then the guy gets up and he says, we believe in a God who can heal. After he spoke, he said that. If you want to be prayed for, for anything, come to the front. I thought, what have I got to lose? So I got out of my seat and I walked to the front. What can I pray you for? I'm thinking, how long have you got? So I told him, I said, I've been a heroin addict 15 years. I'm on 55 mils of methadone. I says, but the main thing I need prayer for is that I hear voices. In fact, my doctor's just sat down there. He says, okay, I'll pray with you. He put his hand on my head. I'm thinking, what's he doing touching me? I thought, I better just roll with it because I'm in his gaff. And he started to pray. And as he started to pray, John, something happened. I was shaking as he was praying. And I remember as he prayed, he kept repeating a phrase after each prayer in the name of Jesus. Yes. And he'd pray again and he'd say that again in the name of Jesus. And as he prayed and repeated that phrase, I was shaking. I had tears streaming down my cheeks. I had a feeling inside like there was fire being poured inside of me. I'm thinking, wow, get your hand off me head. Wow. And then he said, amen. I'm thinking, what does that mean? So I opened my eyes and he'd sat down. Walked back to my seat and something had changed. Completely. Completely. That day I was prayed for in the name of Jesus and I was changed. And I'm with you today, 24 years later, still changed. 24 years clean. So I was once an addict and now I'm clean. So from that moment, you never took another drug? Four weeks after. So I was Four on 55 after. mils of methadone. The next day I took 20. And then I went down five mils a week till I was on zero. I remember walking home, John, walking through the front door of my little flat, yeah. closing the door behind me and standing in the hallway. Silence. You heard no voices. First time in nine years. No voices. See, that's got to be God. Yeah, absolutely. That's got to be God. So this kind of oppression evil, whatever, it, it just lifted. Lifted. That's it. I had an encounter with the living God. And, and you knew it, it had something to do with Jesus. It had to be because I'd been under doctors. I was, I'd been on medication even a lot of the time. I didn't take the medication. When you've been tormented like I was for nine years, these voices said all kinds of horrific things swearing at me. Who do you think you are? You look at you there. Real oppressive things that took away my confidence. Yeah. When you've lived with that for nine years and then those voices go. Yeah. There is a God. He's got to be real. That's what it was like. And that, that, that light came on. And since then, still all these years later, that light is still on. Still on. It's got to be God, because it, it wasn't me. It so wasn't... then after that, I mean, what did the psychiatrist say? Well, I, well, he became a friend. And I could give you his phone number now, and you could ring him, and he would verify all of this. <laughs> Samuel Yangi is not in the same area now. He's, he's, yeah. he's living in Lincoln. He's still a doctor, and he's still he's leading the church as well. Well, he used to come to my house, and he, started, he was one of the leaders, the elders, and he'd come to the house, and he started to pray for me. So he became a friend. But I remember thinking... Well, I need to come up with medication. And I'm not saying advising this to everybody. No, but this is your this story. This is my story. And yeah. this is the way that it worked with me. Because I'd had this encounter. So I thought, oh, it'd be easy because I'm going to go and see my doctor. And it's going to be Dr. Sam Dr. Samuel Yangi. So I made my appointment. When I turned up, it wasn't Dr. Samuel Yangi. It was this white guy. And I'm thinking, oh, I thought. And I tried to explain to this doctor that I'd become a Christian and that God had healed me. Yes. And he didn't kind of get it. No. But Eventually, they released me from my medication. I mean, I wasn't taking it from then on. Yeah. But eventually, then he, he kind of, he saw it, even though he wasn't a Christian. So Samuel's there to verify this. I mean, and that's, that's the amazing thing that God set me up. Absolutely. He got me chatting to a guy on a bus. He put me next to a woman who was going to take me to, lo to the local church. And then he made sure that a doctor was involved so that the doctor could verify this if anybody ever questioned how authentic it was. God was on your case. <laughs> he uh, certainly was. Uh, he certainly was. Now, you spent, as you said earlier, several uh, times in prison. And now you go and speak in prisons. Yeah. So tell us a little bit about your prison ministry over these last few years. Well, in 2010, there was an initiative. And I think it was 08. Oh, no, 08. So it's 2008. It was 08. So we 
arranged at all around prisons. I'd spoken in a few prisons, so I basically always work with the local church doing outreach events in communities throughout the UK. And I'd done some prisons, but in 2008 with OPO8, it was we arranged a tour. So we was in Bristol and we worked with MGM and we was in this part of the country and we brought a band in from this organisation. So we, we, we organised a tour doing 20 prisons. And after the end of 2008, it was like, we can't stop doing that because yes. we'd seen hundreds respond. So then the decision was made then that we would continue to do those prisons every year. So now, usually, yes, I speak in 30 to 40 prisons a year throughout the, the United Kingdom. We've also started an initiative in 2007 when my book came out, Once yes. an Addict, to give a copy of my book free of charge to every prisoner. We've sent 45,000 copies of those yeah. into prisons free of charge. And also we get letters from prisoners, which, which I respond to. So it's basically, Amazing. I speak in prisons. This was pre-COVID. We send books to prisons and then we respond to prisoners. That's incredible. And this is the book that we've mentioned once an addict. So that tells the detail of your story. Yes. So how many of these have you given to prisoners? 45,000. 45,000? Yeah, 45,000. Free? Free, yeah. So we've raised funds through different means. And, That's amazing. Yeah. Yeah, since it came out. You've also started an initiative called Fixed. Just tell us about that. Well, every September we do a conference in Greater Manchester called Fixed. Fixed is a conference for ex-addicts, Recovering addicts, addicts, and those who work with addicts. We started this in 2013. And the idea was, was to bring people together who are, who are addicts or ex-addicts or those who are working with addicts from all over the country. Rehabs come to it. Uh, churches who are, have got groups who are working in, in the community. Yes. So we, we just did one in 2013. as It was an idea. and We believe it was a God idea. And it was absolutely it was just phenomenal. And the only conference like it, and to see all these people with tattoos and scars, you know, beer cans being left in the toilets in the church. I mean, that, that for me was just, this, this, this is, you know, using the church to reach broken people. And we saw like 90 people become Christians. Yes. We had baptisms on that night as well. So spontaneous baptisms. It was, it was, and when we met the next day in the office on the Monday, I said to our guys in the office, we can't, we've got to do that again. And you said to me, remember, John? I do. You, you've got to make that part of your annual yeah, you've got to do that you've annually. Got to. So it so it has become annual. And Amazing. And so, how many people generally come now? Last year we had six hundred plus at our church. And that was maximum. You couldn't, fit, we any couldn't more fit any more in. in. No. So we had an overflow last year. So it's always hosted at my own church, the Bridge in Bolton, Greater Manchester. We've always had it there because I like people to come to my church. Sure. And it's a nice facility, and we've got a great support from from our from my leader and stuff, and and the rest of the staff. So we, we, they work with us on all of that. But last year we, we crammed 620 in. It holds yeah. about 500 in the big hall, but we had an overflow and there were people stood up at the back. So legally, we just got yeah. in what we could get in legally. So that was, but it, it was it's And intense. what's the main teaching that you do at the conference? I do an evangelistic message. So that's, you're that kicks us off always. introducing them to Jesus. Yeah. Because so obviously that's, the that's your story. Yeah. Yeah. That I, unless you encounter Jesus, That's it. We're you're not going to get liberated. First session is always me. Meet Jesus. Evangelistic message. Meet Jesus. And we see we see tens and like fifties. Well, that's last year I think it was hundred and ten or something like that. Respond. Yes. So we we deal with that, and then we have other speakers. All who've come from a similar background, not the same story. We've got people who have been ex-working girls, uh, people who've, who've, who've been, you know, all, all different all kinds, sorts. all sorts. So, but we'll have like a main session, three three main sessions of, of teach, uh, two sessions of teaching. Me, we'll preach the gospel. And then we have six breakouts, all yes. speakers who are working with addicts or have been an addict. So that's like the teaching that goes on for the, for the, the different groups that it caters for. So it's a, an intense day. Uh, but we bring people together from like half past nine till 10 at night. And it's just, it's thriving. It's, yeah. it, it, it's, it's electric and seeing all these people respond and, and, and getting prayed for and stuff. So we started something and, and because Absolutely. you said, we'd had that conversation and when you sure. said to me, you need to make that, that needs to happen every year. Because yeah. we were, and, and it has become a, a very big part of, of what we do. Of what you do. Yeah. Uh, so if people want to know more about your ministry and, and know about Fixed, how can they get information? If they go to our website, proclaimtrust.org.uk, proclaimtrust.org.uk. It's all on there. It's all on there. The conference is on there and books and various other Brilliant. things. Brilliant. Yeah. Now, people who are listening in now, Barry, 
uh, maybe they're, they're, they're struggling with some form of addiction, okay, what would you advise them? If they came to you now and said, Barry, what do I do? How do I get out of this? How do I get delivered or healed? Well, I think it starts, John, like it did with me, when we give God permission to come into our life, when we give him consent to come in. Because I believe that God wants to come into all our lives, but he'll never try and break in, he'll never try and burgle his way in. If he was a burglar, he'd wait for it to go dark and he'd come and try and kick in the back door. If he couldn't kick in the back door, he'd try and kick in the side door. If he couldn't kick in the doors, he'd try and jam in through the windows. That's if God was a burglar, but he's not. So God will only ever come in through the legal entry, the front door, which is our will. And on that day in that church, 20 odd years ago, what I did, I gave God consent to come in. And when you give God consent to come in, you're giving him permission to get active in your life and to get busy. And he starts to work with you. It becomes a partnership. He doesn't do everything for you. He does everything with you. It becomes a partnership and you work together. And that's what happened with me. So if, it, if somebody is watching now and, 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 and you've got a, a problem with addiction, whatever, it, whatever kind of addiction that may be, maybe it, it is drugs, or it might be alcohol, or it could be gambling, or it could be sex, or whatever it is. You've got to remember that God is never going to break into your life. You have got to give him permission to come in through the legal entity. That's what happened with me, and it can happen with you. Okay, so that's the starting point, okay? Um, and then, okay, someone has done that and is, and is still battling with various addictions, you know, whether it's pornography or yeah. whatever. Okay, what advice would you now give? Well, I've told you my story, as, as you said a, a moment ago, that this is my story. All our stories are different. So this is my story. This is how God has worked in me. But it doesn't always work that way. Yeah. It, it does work that way. I could introduce you to hundreds of people where it's been the same, but it's not always the case. So some people might give God consent to come in, but they might not want to let go of something. Yes. Or they might want to let go, but they can't let go. Yes. I think the first thing is you need to be part of a local church because when I talk about Samuel being my friend, who was my doctor, he came round and he started to pray that I had the support from the church. So when I had questions, when I was withdrawing from drugs or because of those first four, four weeks, after coming out of church, I was dropping my mum. I was able to go to my doctor and, and others in the church, like the leader of the church. So I had that support base and they gave me wisdom. Well, why don't you try this? Why don't you do that? So it could be that somebody needs to go into a rehab. Absolutely. And to use the tools that a rehab uses. So Fix Conference, we've got them all there more or less. Yes. And, and, and a lot of the guys that speak at Fix, some of them have had a similar encounter to me, but some of them have been through the through a rehab and the rehabbers give them the tools that they've needed to get clean and stay clean. Great. So the church, but then get the support from the church and then get the direction maybe from the leadership. But remember there are organizations out there, especially nowadays, back in the day, there was a lot of organizations no. and a lot of the Christian ones now are really good. So you get into a Christian rehab, you get the, the input, the, the spiritual input, but you also get the tools that are gonna help you Absolutely. Stop. So Barry, anyone now that's listening that wants to know Jesus, could you now lead them in a prayer of commitment? Sure, sure. So if you're watching, wherever you're watching, and it could be that you've never taken drugs, but you're intrigued by a story by somebody who has taken drugs and how, how, we, how I have ended up not on drugs at all. Wherever you are, if you have never given God consent to come into your life, God is stood outside your life and he wants to come in. That's the bottom line. He's not going to force his way in. He's only going to come in when you give him consent. So what I'll do now, just to, just to land this bit, is pray a prayer to give you the opportunity to give God consent to come in through the legal entry, which is your front door. So if you want to pray this with me, I'm going to pray it phrase by phrase. I'll leave a space after each phrase that space is for you to repeat the phrase that I've prayed, okay? Wherever you're watching, whoever you are, if God is not in your life and you want to give him consent to come in, pray this prayer with me. Dear God, I come to you today and I admit that I'm not perfect. God, I ask that you forgive me for all my faults, 
for all my flaws and for all my failures. God, I ask that you wipe my slate clean. Because right now, I'm opening my door and I'm giving you consent to come in. Sit in my driving seat and bring your direction to my life. I ask this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Barry, thank you. Could you pray one more prayer for any of our viewers who are struggling with any form of addiction, if you could pray a prayer of healing. Sure. Father, I wanna pray for viewers. Again, wherever they may be watching from right now, I wanna pray for anybody who's struggling with any kind of addiction, whatever that may be. And I wanna pray right now for freedom, for a release, from that addiction. I want to pray for a miracle that people watching will be released, that they will be set free as you bring healing to them in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Barry, uh, I'm reminded of uh, what it says about the Samaritan woman in John chapter 4 when she encountered Jesus uh, and then she went and met her neighbours and they believed because of the woman's testimony. Thank you so much for sharing uh, a bit of your own journey and a bit of your own uh, transforming story and testimony. And our, our prayer is that you will uh, continue uh, to proclaim God's gospel, God's good news uh, in prisons and around the UK and beyond. Thank you, Barry, for joining us on Facing the Canon. Thank you for having me, Jay John. Thank you. Wow. I mean, honestly, is, was that not wow? Uh, certainly, I've had a faith lift, and I hope you've had a faith lift. Just hearing of what Jesus uh, can do uh, and has done uh, in Barry's life. And um, if you did pray the, that first prayer, uh, we pray that you would continue uh, in your journey of faith and pray that the second prayer that Barry prayed uh, would begin a healing process and if you do need to seek professional counsel please do that but also take that advice and encouragement from Barry uh, to be part of a local church uh, where you can get spiritual help and spiritual guidance. Thank you for joining us on Facing the Canon God bless you.